Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This Bible study is going to be on study to show thyself approved unto God. So let's start off with the second book of Timothy chapter 2 and that will be our introduction. Uh, this book was written by Paul. Generally all people that are scholars generally accept that Paul wrote 2 Timothy. Timothy was a young man who had been taught from a very young age by his mother and grandmother. And you can have somebody that's basically 20 years old that knows a lot more about the Bible than somebody that's been, you know, 50 years old, claims, oh, I've been a Christian all my life, but they never bothered to read the Word of God. I mean, it's it's really sad. So, with that in mind, and oh, by the way, people will claim that uh, Paul is a false apostle, but you got to realize something. If Christ called Paul to the ministry, and you reject Paul, are you not also rejecting him who sent Paul? I think so. All right, real quick. John chapter 5 and verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, speaking of Christ, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So if you don't have the Son of God, you don't have God the Father either. So, yeah. Uh, before we do that, let's go to Psalms chapter 2. I love Psalms chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? Heathen. Boy, you don't, you don't hear that word very often anymore in so-called church circles, do you? You know, they want you to think that anybody and everybody can be saved. All they got to do is believe in Jesus. But the Bible declares that there is the heathen. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. Vain means worthless. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. See, the Lord has enemies, and the Lord's people has enemies. But the so-called modern church world refuses to tell you this and identify who the enemy is. So, the kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Do you know the Lord has those that are his anointed? Now, anointing was had double meanings. A lot of words in English have double meanings. I remember as a young kid, uh, we used to tell, uh, well, it really wasn't a joke, but, you know, why did the golfer, you know, like Tiger Woods, you know, playing golf, G-O-L-F, why did the golfer wear two pairs of pants? Hmm, that's a good question. In case he got a hole in one, which is a golf term for putting the ball in the hole, uh, you know, on the first shot. Personally, I used to enjoy watching sports, not golf, not tennis, not basketball, but I used to like football and 
uh, for you people in Europe, uh, football is not soccer, but I digress. So at least in America, it's not soccer, you know. Yeah, I know soccer is far more uh, popular worldwide than uh, American football, but yeah, but now it's, uh, I find it disgusting. Uh, but yeah, sports, to keep the masses uh, brains occupied with things that are vain, worthless, useless. I mean, why read the Bible that people died for when you can watch uh, grown men and women try to put a ball into a uh, a hole or whatever or yeah or hit a ball or throw a ball or dribble a ball or what a kick a ball I don't know but God's anointed in the Old Testament when they when God wanted to have one of his prophets anoint a king they would take olive oil and pour it on his head Olive oil was indicative of the Holy Spirit. But the anointing in the New Testament is the, well, the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whatever you want to call it. So I've been to so-called Pentecostal churches and they, oh, he's got such an anointing because he can go, you know, uh, and I was like, what the heck is going on here? You know, when they're saying things that I don't understand, I mean, they could be saying in another language, oh, Lucifer is Lord, you know, but I don't know what they're saying. So, but God has an anointed people. So the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Hmm. So in other words, we don't want to be bound by God's rules and his laws. Uh, the church of Satan, their favorite saying that I know of is do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, do whatever you want. That's their law. They want to murder a Christian? Go for it. You know, you want to sleep around with uh, whores? Uh, go for it. You want to do drugs? Go for it. If it feels good, do it. So, they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You know God's going to laugh at them? Oh, yeah. The Lord shall have them in derision. Derision. Oh, man. What does that word mean? Hmm. Let's take a look at Webster's 1825 Dictionary or 1828 dictionary excellent excellent bible resource if you don't have it uh a hard copy i would suggest it i mean right now i use the internet but there's going to come a day when the internet's going to be shut off cell phones are going to be cut off the landlines are going to be cut off uh because they're not going to want us communicating with each other i suspect there will be a come a day when you're new cars that are computerized will not work. So might be a good idea to have, I don't know, maybe a motorcycle, electric bike, bicycle, uh, maybe an old car with points, plugs, condenser. And if you remember that, you is old puppy doggy. Yeah, I do remember that. I used to give my own, I had a Volkswagen Beetle, 76. And uh, I used to, I took it to the uh, car dealer, Volkswagen South, down in Miami. And 
to get a tune-up. And it actually ran worse when I got it back from them than when I took it in. You know, I was like, I paid all this money for this for what? So I bought a Chilton's uh, car repair guide and bought all the stuff I needed and uh, started doing my own tune-ups. And believe me, when it comes to mechanical stuff, I've got 10 left thumbs. But if this idiot can do it, anybody can. But points, plugs, and condensers. Uh, you know, they, they can't kill those cars, which is why they did the cash for clunkers in my opinion, they get the old cars off the road because, hey, if you got a modern car with a computerized thing, you know, uh, but they are actually able to send kill signals through probably maybe the cell phone towers, I don't know, but they can actually shut cars off. Um, I, I think it was General Motors, I'm not sure, maybe it was Ford, I don't know, but somebody was behind on their car payments and they shut the car off and lo and behold here comes the tow truck picks it up and takes it and repossesses it yeah on the highway can you imagine that and uh you know that's happened more than a few times so they have the ability to remotely kill your car so just keep that in mind but uh, one day, it will be a good idea to have uh, paper Bibles. Uh, doesn't hurt to have a concordance. Uh, get an old strong, something from the 80s, 70s. You know, go to Amazon, buy used books. Uh, Webster's 1828, where he was a language scholar. Uh, from what I understand, he knew over 20 languages fluently. He knew all the root words and their meanings. I mean, when I started studying uh, all the root words and their meanings, I, you know, it's amazing. Uh, to me, I don't know. I, I guess I'm weird because, you know, I'm not watching sports and uh, seeing who's screwing who on the soap operas on television and uh and I don't mean to be crude, but, you know, let's face it, television's filth. But, uh, you know, I find it more interesting to do this, uh, to study, than to watch garbage. I don't know. So derision, it's a noun. Uh, Webster says, the act of laughing at in contempt. Contempt manifested by laughter and scorn an object of derision or contempt a laughing stock so yeah but uh, Webster was the original Webster's dictionary was he was a, a Bible believer and a scholar and matter of fact when you look up derision guess what there are he references Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7 and Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 14. Yeah, he actually references Bible references to the word. Maybe not all of them, but you know, you get the idea. Guy was a scholar, man. I, I wow. So here it is, uh, Psalms 2-4. You know, when the rulers try to kick away God's laws, and they don't want God's rulership. The Bible says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Oh, you guys think you can uh, uh, overpower me and kick me out of the world that I created? Ha 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 We'll see how that works. Uh, maybe something along those lines, the Lord will say so. Then shall he, the Lord, speak unto them in his wrath, wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Oh, man. It's going to be called payday. Oh, yeah, big time. Now, there's a big difference between judgment and wrath. Everybody's going to see judgment. But wrath is a whole nother that's extreme anger 
you know I uh, even Christians are going to be judged you know I'm I got a lot of things to answer for uh, not just before I believe but after you know I I've not been dis I've been disobedient and I've been spanked a few times I think my rear end is still red um, but yeah you get the idea so all right so the Lord's gonna he's gonna I guess you could say he's gonna kick some he's gonna kick some butt uh, I guess that would be the modern uh, the modern day translation right verse 6 yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion who is this king uh, if you don't know, uh, I'm going to give you a little hint. His name is Jesus, and he is the Christ. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one day he's going to return in glory with his army, a cloud of witnesses, and there's going to be hell to pay. Matter of fact, the Bible says that the blood shed upon this earth of the wicked is going to come up to the horse's bridle and just so you think i'm not pulling verses out of context revelation 14 and verse 20 and the wine press you know symbolism in the bible was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of blood on this earth. And that's why the Lord's going to have to have a new earth. Because this one is so polluted. Oh, yeah. Oh, by the way, I looked up bridal. Uh, it's a noun and also a verb, depending upon the way you use it but it's the um you know we're we have cars you know we don't use horses anymore horses were uh you know used for what uh thousands of years that was the mode of transportation for a lot well for the well well to do but uh, it's only been what the last 200 years that we've gotten away from horses you know, maybe, I don't know, something like that. But um, the bridle was like the, um, well, Webster says, the instrument in which a horse is governed and restrained by a rider, consisting of a headstall, a bit, and reins, and other app appendages according to its particular form and uses. So you're talking about something going up to the horse's head and shoulders blood that high i mean you talk about what over probably over five foot of blood boy that's that's a lot of blood well you know you're talking what seven eight billion people uh, all right so let's go back to Let's see. Let's go back to Second Psalms chapter 2. <clears throat> Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And Jerusalem was called the holy city of God. And Zion. You know, I was going to look up Zion which has nothing to do with Zionism, uh, modern day, which is a political movement, not a religious movement. But if memory serves me correctly, uh, Zion is Jerusalem. So, uh, and called the city of David. You know, this might be worth a Bible study one day. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, let's see. How about 2 Kings 19.21? This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him 
The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Hmm. And then verse 31, 2 Kings 19, 31. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So you got Jerusalem mentioned and Zion. So, I mean, that was the capital of Judah. So, I don't know. Uh, it might be worth doing a study of that one day. All right, uh, Psalms chapter 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Holy hill of Zion. Do you know that Jerusalem's built on seven hills? Oh, yeah. Every time you read the Bible and somebody says, let us go up to Jerusalem. It was up on a hill. Yeah, seven of them. But they'll always point to Rome being on seven hills. They'll never tell you, uh, when they're talking about Mystery Babylon being on seven hills, they'll never tell you about Jerusalem being on there. Well, almost nobody. But they'll sure point to Jerusalem or Rome. Never Jerusalem. Just a thought. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree... The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Isn't Jesus called the only begotten son? Begotten, not born, begotten. Big difference. Big, big difference. You see, Islam will say God has no son. Well, they're right. Their God has no son. Allah has no son. Well, maybe they do. <laughs> uh, in Genesis 6, uh, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and no, godly men do not marry ungodly women who have children that turn into giants like Goliath with six fingers and six toes. It just doesn't work that way, people. But that's, uh, I got a whole nother Bible study on that if, you know, if you're interested. That's another lost doctrine. People say, oh, it's a new doctrine. No, it's not. It's thousands of years old. The Christians that actually study the Bible knew these things. But those that listen to television preachers, well, I'm not even sure they know who Jesus is. What can I tell you? Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me. The Lord says, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Guess what? Countries that had Christians in them colonized the whole parts of the earth. I mean, there was a time when England had colonies all over the world, and it was daytime somewhere in an English colony somewhere in the world. It was, they, they said that the sun never set on the English Empire. There was a time when that was true. When you had Bible-believing Christians praying for their king. Uh, and I know they've had some bad kings. Uh, we won't even talk about the current one. But were they, you know, were, were, they, were they perfect? No. I worked with a, an Indian guy. India, not American native Indian that they call them, but Indians, I call those, the Native Americans, I call them Indians. But a Hindu Indian from India, he told me that his grandfather always said 
they were far better off, the general people were far better off under British rule than they were under their own kind. Because they don't care if their people starve. They don't care. Rather than feed their people, they bag the rice up and sell it overseas. And if people starve, so what? They have uh, vehicles, carts, whatever, I don't know, that go through the major cities in India and every day picks up the, what, you know, they consider the trash, the people that starve to death. Every day, people in India starve to death, and yet they export food so that the rich can get richer. British didn't do that. The British made sure everybody got fed. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a an Indian, a, a Hindu Indian telling me this stuff. You know, I, we used to work together. Can you imagine that? And, and a, a lot of our original laws, England and the United States, came from the Bible. Believe it or not, a lot of our laws did. But we ignore those laws now, so. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Colonies, people. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Oh, yeah, the heathen. You're going to tell me India with their thousands or hundreds of thousands of different gods, plural, uh, uh, lowercase g, rod of iron, iron cannons, steel, and swords, and rifles. I mean, conquered all the third world heathens. But no longer, because we fell away from the Lord. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, o ye, o ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Verse 12, very good information right here. Kiss the Son, the only begotten Son, right? Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled, what is kindled? It has reference to starting a fire. The, this world is going to be destroyed in fire, people. I did an entire series playlist on fire. Yeah. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Put your trust in the sun, people. And I need to look in a mirror and, yeah, do the same thing. So, all right, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Boy, 30 minutes and I haven't even touched Timothy yet. Wow. Bob, what are you doing? Uh, I guess I'm getting caught up in rabbit trails. And oh, by the way, uh, one day the power may go out. And I mentioned, you know, cell phones not working and what have you. Uh, something to consider, CB radios. Yeah. Uh, you never know. It might be the only way to communicate. For a while or ham radio i you know something to consider something to consider so second timothy chapter 2 verse 1 thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in jesus christ what is grace grace is unmerited favor you're Getting mercy for something you do not deserve. Boy, I'll tell you what. Tell me about that. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. Very, very good point. You know, this is why people need to read 
their Bible or, you know, you can go on Amazon, get the New Testament, uh, Alexander Scorby on whatever, MP3 or whatever it is for basically 20 something dollars. I mean, really, you know, listen to it on your way to work every day like I do. So, or you can listen to satanic rock and roll or country music and, uh, you know, watch, uh, was it Billy Ray Cyrus's daughter, Miley Cyrus, you know, uh, in concert where she's uh, spanking a balloon shaped like a penis, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, those, those kind of people, you know. I mean, why waste your time reading the Bible when you could be watching, you know, Disney filth, you know. All right. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. And John, John the Baptist, and no, he wasn't John the Southern Baptist, John the Baptist, calling unto him uh, two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another, the Christ, right? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and unto many that were blind he gave sight see the lord was given power to heal supernaturally and by the way in the end times the false prophet for the beast the man of sin the son of perdition the antichrist whatever by whatever name you want is going to be able to do some of the similar miracles. I'm not sure what. Miracles and lying wonders. And I cover that in my previous uh, videos that I just did. A lot of people are going to be fooled. Those that don't know the Bible are going to be fooled. Absolutely. Especially when the antichrist and we're going to cover that soon who they are especially when all the church so-called world tells you that the uh those that are antichrist uh the messiah has come you better believe people that don't know their bible they're going to be fooled they're going to worship the beast they're going to go to hell Jesus warned, but they don't care. The Bible, the bother reading the Bible. What a waste of my time, Lord. Why should I read the Bible? It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you didn't pray the prayer of James chapter 2, where it says, if any of you lack understanding, let him ask of God. Get on your hands and knees in prayer and ask the Lord for understanding. And then read. But no, we won't do that. You know, people died to give us the word of God in our language. William Tyndale, read about his life. He died. He was burned at the stake alive so that we might have the Bible. The King James Bible drew heavily on William Tyndale's work. Guy was a scholar, man, you know, and they won't even bother reading it. But boy, they can tell you the sports scores and, you know, oh, my favorite basketball team and, and you know, uh, yeah, you know, the my favorite quarterback or, you know, ugh. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, art thou he that should come or look we for another? When men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Evil spirits, demonic possession, possessed of devils. Uh, if you take devil, take away the D, then you have the word evil. Or take the word evil evil and put a D in front of it and you got devil. I believe that 
uh, casting out devils out of people or casting out demons, whatever you want to call it, was probably the thing that Jesus cured more than anything else. Do you realize that anybody that's not in the Lord can be possessed of a devil? I bet you 99% of Congress is probably possessed of devils. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. Well, not just Congress, but, you know, all your world leaders. Uh, yeah. So Jesus is curing people. Verse 22. So they asked a question. Are you the one or do we look for somebody else? Verse 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see. And not just uh, physical vision, spiritual vision. Those that were blind to the Lord can see. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead are raised. To the poor the gospel is preached, not the rich, not those that trust in their wealth. Oh boy, I got $2 million in my bank account. Nothing can come bad to me, they'll say. Verse 23, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. I did an entire Bible study on offended. Is Jesus offending you? Is Jesus offensive? To the modern world, yeah, he's offensive. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? No. You ever heard that expression? Uh, politicians always go whatever way the wind blows. You know, yeah, but an oak tree doesn't do that, does it? No. A reed shaken with the wind? No. John the Baptist did not did not go with every wind of doctrine. No, he taught straight from the he shot straight from the hip. You could say, I guess you could say. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Soft clothing? No. Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. You want soft clothing? You got to go to the king's court, right? But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And this is in the book of Isaiah. Now I did a, I think I did a Bible study on John the Baptist too. Verse 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him, John the Baptist, and the publicans, the tax collectors, justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. John's baptism was for the remission of sins, washing away of sins. It was symbolically washing the dirt off your flesh. It was symbolism, symbolic, right? You know, the washing of the flesh. Christ is going to wash us in the Spirit with fire and His blood. Oh, yeah. But the Pharisees, oh, yeah, the you-know-whos, and lawyers, and not modern-day lawyers, these were doctors of the law, of the Bible law. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. Oh, yeah. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? 
They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a devil. He didn't come eating and drinking wine. And they said, Oh, he's demon-possessed. The Son of Man, Christ, is coming, is come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bigger, wine bibber. Oh yeah, we got a drunken pig here. Guy eats everything and drinks a bunch of wine, you know. He's a drunken pig, a friend of publicans and sinners. So you ever heard the expression, damned if you do, damned if you don't? John the Baptist didn't drink wine, but damned if he don't. And Jesus came drinking wine, and he's damned if he do. Verse 35. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Wisdom. In the Bible, wisdom is uh, those that study the Lord's words. Guided by the Spirit of God. You know, that would make another Bible, excellent Bible study. Wisdom. Yeah. All right, let's look at wisdom real quick. One of the things I love about the King James Bible that doesn't work in any of the modern Bibles is when you do a, a word lookup, let's say, oh, what is wisdom? Well, generally, if you look the first time it is mentioned in the Bible, in the context, it'll give you an idea of what the meaning of the word is. So, wisdom. First place it appears, Exodus 28, verse 3. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of wisdom. The, the Holy Spirit knowledge from the Holy Spirit, that they may make Aaron's garments. Who was Aaron? Aaron was the brother of Moses. He was a Levite. He was one of the priests. He was the priest. He was the priest. He was the very first priest of the Lord. Oh, yeah. Levi was the tribe of the priests. Hmm. Hmm. Whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him. What does it mean to be consecrated? It means to be set apart for the Lord's service. So they got the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Wow. Wow. Exodus 31 3 and I have filled him with the Spirit of God the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship you get the idea I hope so Wow all right uh, do, 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 do. let's go back to Luke 735 but wisdom is justified of all her children and one of the pharisees now pharisees was a denomination of the jews not all jews were pharisees but all pharisees are jews and one of the pharisees desired him christ that he would eat with him and he went into the pharisee's house and sat down to meet and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner I can relate to that. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping. She's crying and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Wow. I can relate to that. 
Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, you know, the Pharisee that invited him for dinner, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Hey, Simon, I got something to tell you. And he saith, Master, say on. Jesus speaking, verse 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owned, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now, one pence was the, uh, it was a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. So you're talking an unskilled laborer working 500 days. That's basically two years, uh, almost around two years. So you had two, two people that owed this creditor 500 pence and the other 50. So the one guy owes 10 times more than the other. Verse 42. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Oh, you guys can't pay me? No problem. You know I could put you in prison for not paying me what you owe me. But I'm not going to do that. I forgive you your, what you owe me. I mean, think about it. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said to Jesus, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he, Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Oh yeah, you got that one right, buddy boy. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. Remember in Psalms chapter 2, it said, Kiss the son lest he be angry. Oh yeah. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he, Jesus, said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? Yeah, who does this guy think he is saying he can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Well, guess what? Jesus is God. Verse 50. And he said unto the woman, and he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now there's a group of people that claim to be what they call oneness. And they'll tell you, well, there's only God the Father. That's it. Uh, and they'll say, well, we don't believe in the Trinity. That's a, that's a Catholic thing. It's a lie. I, I've got an entire study on that, if you're interested. But basically what they're doing is denying that Jesus is God the flesh. Never mind what 1 Timothy 3.16 says. Never mind that. Yeah, you know, it says God was manifest in the flesh. And they'll deny that the Holy Spirit is God too. Even though the Holy Spirit is called He. Oh yeah, He. Um, and when you hear the she kind of thing, 
You ever heard of Shekinah? The Shekinah is the female goddess, the wife of God. Where does that come from? Uh, well, let's take a look. Well, that's in the book of Titus, chapter 1 and verse 14. Another book by Paul. He says, not giving heed. In other words, don't pay attention. Not giving heed to Jewish fables. Ah, uh, yeah, the Shekinah. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Sorry, the Shekinah is not the Holy Spirit. No, no. Holy Spirit's called a he. You know, there's a reason why it's called the Shekinah. S-H-E. Shekinah. No. So. Yep. Grace. Unmerited mercy. You know, if people study their Bibles uh, and knew it inside and out, these preachers could not get away with their lies. They couldn't do that. I mean, you get a people, 30 people in a building on a Sunday, you know, S-U-N day, not S-O-N day. Big difference between Sunday and Sunday. You yeah, ask me, anyways. To me, every day is S O N day, but I digress. But they couldn't get away with it. They couldn't get away with it, and they wouldn't be arguing over uh, pronouns. And uh, yeah, but uh, well, like I've mentioned, whatever the church tolerates, the Lord will allow. And the evil will spread like a cancer. And the Bible even says that the love of many shall wax cold. And that is in Matthew 24. And I did an entire playlist on Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24 revealed. Very important chapter in the Bible. Very, very important. I mean, they're all important, but some are, my opinion, more important than others but jesus speaking and because iniquity what is iniquity iniquity is gross evil sin terrible wickedness and because iniquity shall abound in other words grow and because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold People, their love for Jesus will grow cold because of all the evil in the world. Oh, yeah. All right, so... Uh, let's see. All right, so... Let's take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Boy, I've almost talked for an hour and I haven't even touched the, yeah, the chapter. Boy, what an idiot. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we're supposed to learn so that we can teach others who will teach others. But instead, they go to Bible colleges. I call them Bible cemeteries. You know, they call them a seminary, but I call them cemeteries because it's full of dead men's bones. Not just physically dead, but spiritually dead. You know? Yeah, I went to Bible college. Why? Uh, not so much to learn the Bible, but to... Well, a couple reasons, but... One, I got tired of people throwing in my face. Oh, well, what do you know? I went to Bible college. I, I've got a, a doctorate degree in the Bible. So, Bob, you're an idiot. You know, I, you know, they use that as their justification. And, but that's not the main reason why I went. The main reason uh, when studied Bible college was 
so that I could learn the lies that they were teaching so that I could refute them. I mean, you got to know what they believe to prove it wrong. Of course, if you don't know the Bible, you can't do that. So, we are to teach others so that others can teach others. Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. People, I don't know, you know, ladies, you, you'll you never, uh, chances are, the great majority of you have never been in the military. But let me tell you something. The life of a soldier, sailor, airman is not a bed of roses. Well, it may be the thorns, but uh, yeah, hardness. It's not good. You know, being a soldier for Christ is not an easy thing. It is not. Trust me. I've gotten death threats, but I don't care. You know, um, I've known, I've known since late 1989 that I might have to uh, give up my life to be with Christ. I've known that for what, almost uh, eh, close to 20, you know, over 22 years. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, 32 years. Boy, I can't even count anymore. So, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth, you know, a man that has, you know, warring, fighting, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. I guess I was chosen to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You want to be given the crown of life? You better, you better do things the Lord's way. That's the way it works. The husband, husbandmen, and that has nothing to do with being married to a woman. Uh, you're talk, a husbandman is somebody that takes care of a vineyard or an orchard of trees, you know, prunes the trees and makes sure they get fertilized or whatever. And, you know, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You know, the guy that goes out into the uh, apple orchard, He's going to be able to get the first apples, right? I mean, he's the one cutting them down. If he sees one that looks perfect, he's going to say, man, I'm going to try this one. You know, clean it off and eat it, right? So those that partake, those that labor in the Lord are going to be the first partakers of the fruits of the Lord. My guess. So, verse 7. Remember what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding wisdom right and the lord give the understanding in all things remember that jesus christ of the seed of david was raised from the dead according to my gospel if you don't believe that jesus christ was raised by the dead from the dead you don't understand the gospel where up, wherein I suffer trouble, trouble, tribulation, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer would, as an evildoer. See, Paul didn't do evil, but he's suffering like he, as an evil, he's suffering trouble as an evildoer, same way, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Uh, the Vatican, the Catholic Church, which was infiltrated many, many centuries ago, would bind up the Word of God. Oh, yeah. They killed people. 
people that dared to put the Bible into the language of the common people were put to death for daring telling people what the words of Christ meant in their language. You know, not everybody knows Greek or Hebrew. I can only imagine what's going to happen to those people. Can you imagine killing people for trying to let them know what Jesus Christ said in their language, whether it be German, French, English, those that killed people to prevent them from hearing the Bible in their own language, the words of Christ. Uh, and then you got idiots that will say, ah, oh, well, hell doesn't exist. There's a guy named Jim Rizzoli, I think his name is pronounced. He's with InfoWars or whatever, you know, Alex Jonestein. I mean, Bill Hicks. Yeah, Bill Hicks, a comedian. Bill Hicks, a comedian, disappears. Alex Jones appears. Yeah. Take a look at picture of Alex and, and Bill and tell me that's not the same person. Yeah. And guess who Alex Jonestein was married to? Uh, I'll give you three guesses. And she probably wore a six-pointed star around her neck. Or maybe a red string on her wrist. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you see somebody wearing a red string around their wrist, uh you know that's the enemy yeah but the word of god is not bound therefore verse 10 therefore i paul endure all things for the elect's sake do you know god has an elect uh but i don't believe it's the antichrist over yeah we're going to cover that the antichrist Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. God does have a chosen people, an elect, but they're not who the modern TV preachers teach. See, the Bible says God has enemies, and there are heathen but the so-called church world will tell you, oh, well, anybody and everybody can come to Christ. Oh, yeah, they can all come to Christ and they're, they're going to all be saved. Well, if that's true, open up the borders. Let everybody into the West, you know, into Europe and the United States. Just open the borders up. Let them all in. They can all be saved, right? So, you know, uh, but that's not what the Bible says. Did God make a mistake when he separated the people? You know, he put one group in Africa and another group in Asia and another group in Europe. I'm talking about races here. Did God make a mistake that the world has to fix? Huh. Verse 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him in the flesh, we shall also live with him in the spirit. Well, and a resurrected body one day. If we suffer, if we suffer because of Christ, we shall also reign with him Reign, as in ruling and reigning, as in uh, government, not water falling from the sky. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And Jesus says that in Matthew 24, that uh, those that deny Christ, Christ will deny us. If you deny Jesus to save your life in this world, Christ will deny you before the Father and his angels. And yes, I know Peter denied Jesus three times, but guess what? He repented and he died for the faith. 
So if they stick your head on the guillotine and say, oh, all you got to do is deny Jesus and we'll let you go free. Think about it. One day that may come to pass. But if you don't deny Jesus and they pull the lever and the blade comes down and cut your head off, talk about a painless way to die. I mean, what, a fraction of a second? Almost painless. Guess what? You close your eyes, the blade comes down, and when you open your eyes, guess where you are? Under the altar, waiting for your resurrected body. You're with Christ. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things, put them in remembrance. All these things that Paul's writing to Timothy, remember them. It's important. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. All right, here's the punchline. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Paul gives a commandment to Timothy. He says, study. Not just read, not just listen. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you go to a Baptist Bible cemetery, cemetery, they'll say, rightly dividing the word of truth, that's dispensational theology. They will actually tell you, well, if you look up the word dispensation, it has nothing to do with a period of time, like the Baptist Bible cemeteries will lie to you and tell you. Dispensation has reference, it, well, the root word comes from dispense. You ever heard of a soap dispenser? What are, does, it, does soap come in a period of time? No. You go to the washroom, you wash your hands, get you know, and, and you go to the soap dispenser and you get soap on your hands. It gives you soap. It dispenses soap. It's not a period of time, like those liars say. And there's only two dispensations. The dispensation of law under Moses and the dispensation of grace, Christ. In other words, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Testament, the New Testament. But the liars will tell you, oh, well, there's seven dispensations of time. And they'll say, oh, there's grace and innocence and law and this and that and the other. And, and what they do is they slice the Bible up into time periods and they'll tell you, well, yeah, the Bible did say that we were supposed to get rid of uh, certain people that practice certain abominations like uh, having fun men having fun with each other using the rear entrance if you catch my drift I don't even want to say it because you know censorship but uh, the Bible tells you what to do with those people but they'll say oh no though that was for the you know who's that was that was then that's not now now we're supposed to love them and tell them about how Jesus loves them and we're supposed to embrace them and let them get jobs as elementary school teachers so that they can tell our children about evolution and how Jesus was a myth and the Bible's mistranslated and your parents are a bunch of homophobes. And uh, yeah, you get the idea. And how they're a bunch of racists and horrible people. And they should, be, they're not inclusive enough, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Horrible. Horrible. This is the garbage that they teach in Bible cemeteries.
well, of the Baptist persuasion. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm pretty tough on the Baptists. I know that. I went to one of their schools. I know what they teach. Now, oh, we use the King James Bible, but we really don't believe it because we anything that uh, goes against the modern uh, laws of the state, of which they are, believe it or not, the average so-called church is a business with the name church in it. You know, First Baptist Church, oh yeah. It's actually a creation of the state. They get a state charter to start what they call a business that they call a church. Um, they do it under IRS regulation 501c3. That's so they can keep tax exemption. And to do that, you cannot go against modern um, public policy, they call it. So if they want you using pronouns when you go to the government agencies or whatever, if you go against that and tell people that it's an abomination, you will lose your tax exempt status. Did Jesus go to the Roman government and say, uh, hey, uh, I want to start a church. Can I get a, a charter for a business and be exempted from taxes? No. No. That was one of the big reasons why the United States uh, decided to get away from the Church of uh, break away from England during the American Revolution. The Church of England said that you had to get a license to preach the gospel. In other words, you had to go before the Church of England. You had to tell them that you were going to teach exactly what they taught, no variation, and you had to pay a fee to the government for permission, a license, to preach the gospel. And there was somebody that had been uh, arrested for preaching contrary to that, and he was whipped to death. He was actually, his ribs were showing. That's how bad they beat him. The whip, they whipped him with a bull whip. That's how bad things were under the king, George. And there was a passerby that said, what evil did this man do? And they said, oh, well, he didn't, he wouldn't pay for a license to preach the gospel. And uh, people got fed up with that garbage and they grabbed their rifles and they said, told the crown to hit the road, Jack. Yeah. And you wonder why they want control of all the, uh, you know, the uh, GU, NS. Yeah, they don't want you to have that because they know. So study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Do you know how many people are going to be ashamed because they didn't know the word of God? Do you know people that the whole church, so-called church world is going to tell people the mark of the beast is not the mark of the beast. And they're going to take it so that they can feed them families. And they're going to be ashamed because they're going to be looking at the flames of hell. Well, we're not going to be here for the mark of the beast because we're going to fly away in the pre-trib rapture. Yeah, I don't think so. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word doth eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philet, Philet, Philetius. I don't know, something like that. My Greek, I should have studied Greek, but I didn't. So, Verse 18. These two men, Hymenaeus and Philetius, who concerning the truth have erred. That's where you get the word error from. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past. Huh. 
Do you know the resurrection? Another word for that in the modern so-called church world is rapture. They're saying the rapture is past. The resurrection is past already. And overthrow the faith of some. How can they overthrow the faith of some? Because they didn't study to show themselves approved unto God. They didn't know the word of God. Almost around 2,000 years ago, there were people teaching that the, they missed the rapture. You miss the rapture. You think that's not going to happen again? I bet you it does. You know, when the man of sin appears, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the beast, uh, whatever you want to call him. Uh, what is it? John, in the book of Revelation, calls him the beast. And uh, Paul calls him the son of perdition, the, the man of sin. They can say that the, oh, you missed the rapture, or they can say, oh, there is no rapture. There is no resurrection of Christ. Uh, Christ was a false prophet. He was a false messiah. That's kind of how I'm leaning, but I don't know. You know, there's people that actually teach that in 70 A.D. Christ returned. Yeah. And they teach that this wicked world is the kingdom of Christ right now. Yeah. The Bible says that uh, in Acts, I think it's Acts chapter 2, 1 or 2, and in the book of Revelation, it says, Every eye shall see him when Christ returns in glory. Every eye shall see him. Did you see him come? I must have missed that event. I must have I must have been asleep. Yeah, or I had my eyes closed, you know. I mean, really? You know, they couldn't get away with this garbage if people read their book, read the Bible. You know, the 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 words that people died to give us. People died to give us the Bible. And they won't even bother. They can't be bothered to, to waste their time reading it. Ugh. Who concerning the truth of erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some? Nevertheless, the foundation of God. Foundation. Oh boy. Let's take a look at foundation. Now I did an entire Bible study on the rock. And no, we're not talking about... Uh, uh, the, the movie actor that calls himself The Rock. No. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Jesus speaking. Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why do you call me Lord, but you don't do the things I tell you to? Really? Really? There's going to be a lot of people that will claim Christ and they're going to go to hell because they didn't do anything the Lord said to do. Did they share the gospel with their neighbors? Did they distribute to the poor? Did they help those in need? You know, a lot of, a lot of these people, they'll go to so-called church on Sunday for an hour or two, an hour, you know. And then the whole entire rest of the week, they live like the devil. I've seen it. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them... Yeah, there's people, you know, if you do the things that Christ says to do, there's people that will tell you, oh, that's lordship salvation. You're trying to earn your salvation. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like they'll tell you, all you got to do is believe. Well, in James chapter 2, James says that even the devils believe in God. The devils believe in God. Are they saved? I don't think so. Who, 
Whosoever cometh to me and hearing my sayings and doeth them. So you gotta you gotta come to Christ, hear him, and do those things he says. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the floods of this world, the stream, the river beat vehemently against upon that house. The water beat hard upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not, but he that hears and doesn't do, is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. The sands of this world, the sands are shifted away with every, every time there's a rainstorm, they, they move. Is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Is your house built upon the rock, or is your house built upon sand? Oh, yeah. And what is this rock? Well, I'm going to tell you. Well, the Bible's going to tell you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. Paul. You know that people will tell you Paul's a heretic? I don't think so. I think they're the heretics. Paul writes, And did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. What are they talking about here? They're referencing the book of Exodus. When Moses led Israel out into the desert from Egypt, they didn't have any water. And God said, strike the rock and it will provide water. Well, I'm paraphrasing. Moses did and there was water for everybody. There was probably over 100,000 people and cattle and livestock. That's a lot of water, people. That's a lot of water. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you name the name of Christ, depart from wickedness, people. Ooh, that's Lordship salvation. Boy, I'll tell you what. Uh, they can't get away with this stuff. If people knew their Bibles, they couldn't get away with this stuff. Verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. Boy, that's a tough one, huh? But follow righteousness. Follow righteousness, faith, charity. That word charity in the Greek is also sometimes translated as love. Because if you have love, you're going to have charity. And if you have charity, you got love. Rich people have no love and they have no charity. Unless, of course, they can get a tax donation and control. I've never seen a rich person do anything uh, for an individual. No, they want to help a foundation, a tax-exempt foundation, an organization where they give money to, and then they all sit on the board of directors and pay themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then when you somebody in need goes to the foundation and asks for something, oh, sorry, we don't have funds. And then they, they write off any donations they make on their taxes. 
They have no love, no charity, zero, zippity doo which is why God condemned, why Christ condemned those that trust in riches. I mean, it's just the way it is. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. What's a foolish question? Something that doesn't even matter. I hear people arguing over flat earth. You know, yeah, I know they the, the government lies about everything. I know that. But did Jesus say, uh, believe on me in the flat earth and thou shalt be saved? No. We should be helping our fellow man instead of worrying about the shape of the earth. I mean, it's just, you know. Did Satan have a time machine where he can go back in time and change the Bible? Does that mean that Satan would be more powerful than God? I don't think so. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. What does it mean to be strive, to strive? It means uh, argumentative, argumentative and fighting. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. I hope I'm apt to teach. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Oh, yeah. And that is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Or I'm sorry, uh, Second Tap Timothy chapter two. Um. Now, uh, let's read First John chapter two, and then I guess we'll close this out. Verse one. My little children, these things I uh, write I unto you, that ye sin not. Uh, that's a tough one, huh? And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Uh, advocate. That's an old, older English term. Uh, they used to call lawyers advocates because they would advocate on your behalf. So, just remember something. Don't you want Christ as your lawyer? Uh, yes, Father, the judge. The judge is God the Father, and Christ is your lawyer, the son, his son. Yes, uh, Your Honor, uh, this guy committed this, committed this criminal act, but the price has been paid. So, you know, don't you want Christ to pay the fine? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, the payment. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And whereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What? Keep his commandments? But that's Lordship Salvation, Chaplain Bob. You know, you're earning your salvation. What do you mean keeping commandments? Uh, if you ever heard of the Seventh-day Adventist, uh, there's a uh, guy named Walter Veith. Uh, he's got some good information, but why in the world is he a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I don't know. But uh, supposedly their founder, some woman, I think it was Ellen White, she was taken up into heaven, she says, and then she's looking at the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone that were delivered unto Moses. And the, the keeping the Sabbath commandment was glowing. And she's like, oh, the Sabbath, we got to keep the Sabbath. 
And then they, she was taken back to Earth, and she created her own little religion, and her own little church, so-called. And their big thing is keeping the Sabbath. You know, nothing wrong with keeping the Sabbath, taking a day and, you know, reflecting upon the Lord. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when you start turning it into a doctrine and telling people they got to keep it for salvation, well, yeah, there's a problem with that. What did Jesus say? Now, <laughs> I could show you a couple places in the Bible where it says Jesus broke the Sabbath. Yeah, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. God wanted us to take a day off to rest the, our weak flesh. You know, Matthew chapter 22, verse 35. I know I've beaten this horse, but I'm going to beat it again. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, a doctor of the law, Bible law, asked him, Jesus, a question, tempting him and saying, tempting him. He's trying to trick him up here. He goes, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. You know, you think about it. If you love the Lord, you're not going to worship idols. You're not going to, you know, do anything that's offensive to the Lord, which is contained in the commandments, right? Love the Lord with all thy heart. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to sleep with her wife, his wife. You're not going to steal from him. You know, you're not going to, you know, this. that's basically the Ten Commandments in a nutshell. So let's go back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him, Christ, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So all these people that rail against lordship salvation, and they say, oh, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, and you're saved. Do they really love God? I mean, there's people that will teach you that you can be a hitman for the mafia, kill people for a living, and because you believe in Jesus, you're going to be saved one day. I don't think so. There's people that actually tell you because you said a sinner's prayer as an 11-year-old, that one day you can take the mark of the beast and God can't throw you in hell because you said a sinner's prayer when you were 11. Eternal security, once saved, always saved. No matter what you do, God can't throw you into hell. I don't think I would want to test that theory, but A, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Isn't that what it says? He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Do you keep the word of Christ in you? Because in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. We should walk like Christ walked. Brethren, verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye, have, which ye had from the beginning. That old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. 
He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even unto now. Love thy neighbor. How can you love your neighbor when you hate your brother? Good question. Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And that name's sake is Jesus. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Think about it. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world. Do we love the world? Or do we love the world to come? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I hate the state of this world. I absolutely hate it. I don't know about you, but I sure do. I, I cannot think of much of anything in this world that I like. 16. For all that is in the world. Uh, listen to this. This is the pathology of sin. Uh, you ever heard of uh, pathology of disease? You know, they, they tell you uh, when you're contagious, uh, you're breathing out contaminated, disease-ridden air because you're sick, and the person next to you breathes the air and then they get sick, or you touch something and then they touch it and touch their eyes or their mouth or whatever. You know, that's what pathology is. But this is the pathology of sin. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You know, the lust of the flesh. When you're a young man, the lust of the eyes. You take a go down to the beach, and you see a, a good-looking woman in a thong. Oh, yeah. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, but he that doeth, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Oh yeah. Doing the will of God. I got a Bible study on that too. Oh yeah. You know. Hearing the word of God is very important. Hearing the word of the Lord is very important. Revelation twenty two seventeen And the Spirit and the bride say, come, come, and let him that heareth, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. All right, verse seven, first John two seventeen, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Listen to this, people. This is the definition of the Antichrist. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. 
So there's going to be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. But even now, there's many Antichrists. Um, you go to the Middle East, and uh, there's a lot of Antichrists there. Now, speaking of the enemy, verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Now here's the definition of an antichrist. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. So if anybody denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, they're a liar. They're a liar. Period. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You ever heard preachers saying that the J's, the you-know-who's, well, you know, they don't have Jesus, but... But they got the Father. They don't have the Son, but they got the Father. But that's not... They're liars. They're idiots. They're deceivers. Because if they knew what the Bible said, and they do, you know, you can't go to Bible college for four, six, eight years and not know these things. You can't. It's impossible. They're, they work for the enemy. You know, they're... They, they say, oh, they have a covenant with the Father, but they don't have the Son. But don't worry, after the pre-trib rapture, which isn't going to happen, oh, they're going to come to Christ. No, they're not. They've denied him for 2,000 years, and they're going to keep denying him for another whatever amount of time we have left. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. You don't have the Son, you don't have the Father either. You got neither. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. Wow. Do you know that in Christ we have a promise of eternal life? Verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Yeah, they want to lead you away from Jesus. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing, but as the same anointing teaches you, teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Do you know how many people are going to be ashamed at his coming? Verse 29. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Wow. Wow. Just remember, our righteousness is in Christ. All right, let's read Revelation 7, and we're going to close this out. 
Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. What's this great multitude? This is everybody from, from Adam and Eve until the last saint dies in the tribulation, until Christ returns back. A great multitude. Verse 10. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Remember, John the Baptist, when he beheld Jesus coming to the river Jordan, where he was baptizing people, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. Saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, asking John, that wrote the book of Revelation here. Oh, let's stop here real quick. Do you know that uh, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, he was the only apostle that never died by being killed for uh, the faith. The only one. I, I, He died of old age, from what I understand. From what I understand, they tried to kill him, according to Tradition, legend, whatever you want to call it. They tried to kill him and they couldn't do it. So they banished him on the Isle of Patmos. A little deserted island, you know. Uh, well, we can't kill this guy to shut him up. So let's stick him somewhere where, you know, where he won't do any more damage. So, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, to John, so he's asking him a question. What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Hey, uh, who are these that are uh, dressed in these white robes? And whence came they? Uh, who are these people dressed in white robes? Where do they come from? Verse 14, and, and I, John, said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Hey, what are you asking me for? You know the answer to this question. Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, trouble. Oh, these are they that came out of the pre-trib rapture and didn't have to suffer anything. No, I don't think so. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wow. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. God's temple, not the temple in the Middle East that the Antichrist want to build for their little animal sacrifices as a denial of what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Ooh. What? How's that work? Oh, easy. Uh, let's go to John chapter 4. Yeah, we're going to close this out. Verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now Samaria was the capital city of Israel, and Jerusalem was the capital city of Judah. Yeah, and they'll tell you that... Uh, Jews are all of Israel. Yeah, well, Judah was only one tribe. 
There was 11 others. Yeah. So, and he, Jesus, must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob, who was Jacob? Well, Abraham gave birth to Isaac, and Isaac gave birth to Jacob, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. There you go. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which, he, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Remember Joseph in Egypt? Oh, yeah. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. Why is that? Why, why don't the Jews have dealings with the Samaritans? Well, because God divorced Israel, but not Judah. What? Chaplain Bob, I've been going to church for my whole life, and I've never heard that. I think you're pulling verses out of context. Well, that's in the book of Jeremiah. Oh, wait a minute. That's why pastors tell you, oh, well, don't read the Old Testament. That's a different dispensation. Don't read that. That's for the Jews. That's not for Christians. We're New Testament Christians. Yeah, don't read that because uh, you'll get confused. No, you, you, you might not understand it, but you're not going to be confused. They just can't explain it to where it makes sense because they are liars. Jeremiah verse 3, chapter 3 and verse 8. And I saw the Lord, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel, Israel committed adultery, spiritual adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. God divorced Israel. What? But Chaplain Bob, God's got an everlasting covenant with Israel. Uh, I don't think so. God Gave her a bill of divorce. He divorced, God divorced his wife. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and paid, played the harlot also. What's a harlot? It's a whore. A spiritual whore, right? God divorced Israel, but God didn't divorce Judah. I know, you've never heard that before, have you? No. Well, those that listen to me have heard it, but yeah. But God divorced Israel. But there's good news. Jeremiah 31, 31. And by the way, that's what gospel means. Good news. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Israel and Judah are not the same. They had different kings, different land areas, different capitals. But if you listen to demon nominational preachers, oh, well, they're all the same. No, they're not. Let's go back to John chapter 4, verse 9. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, to Jesus, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Well, of course not. God divorced the Samaritans. They divorced Israel. The Jews didn't want nothing to do with them. Well, true Judah. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Give me to drink. 
thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Wow. Hey, Jesus, can I have some living water? The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Listen to this, this woman, what she's saying to Jesus. Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Are you greater than our father Jacob? This Samaritan woman is a child of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. She's a child of Israel. Divorced Israel. She says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Oh, yeah. The Samaritan woman was Israel. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. A well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith, said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband, in that saidest thou truly. <laughs> You've had five husbands and you're with another guy? Woo! She's been busy, huh? The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Oh yeah, he's a prophet, all right, but he's much more than that. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh that ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And just because somebody claims to be a Jew doesn't mean that's true. Just because somebody says they're a Christian does not make it true. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. You know, that's one of the few things that God asks of us, for us to worship him, to love him, to respect him, to honor him. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah is cometh which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. Let's go back to Revelation 7 and verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is, which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Boy, what a promise, huh? Well, I certainly hope that each and every one of you has enjoyed this study, I guess you could call it. You know, we need to study the Bible to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
and you're not going to get that from any preacher that's on TV. Well, you know, Arnold Murray was okay. Shepherd's Chapel, he was all right. But uh, I always noticed he was on like 5, 5.30 in the morning where I was. <laughs> so, you know, but he was one of the few TV preachers that I actually uh, would listen to. Yeah, so you got an idea of my background. But uh, uh, what can I tell you? Just praise the Lord that he put up with me all these years, waiting for me to do, I hope I'm doing what he wants me to do, so. And I hope I'm, I hope I'm feeding the sheep. I really do, and blessing each and every one of you. And like I say, um, if you want all my work, ten years of studies, send me a USB drive or a SD card, at least sixty-four gig, if not one twenty-eight, and uh, I'll send, I'll send it to you, and I'll even pay the postage. I don't care, you know. But uh, if you need my address, write me. Or, you know, send me an email. Or, I mean, not, well, leave a comment. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. <laughs>